Hi, I'm Yash, and I'll be speaking about my joint work with Bernardo Magdi, Claudia Orlandi, and Omar Stomovitz. In this work, we study proactive security, where only a dishonest majority speaks during the refresh phase, and the rest stay offline and catch up at their own leisure. We formalize the notion of unanimous erasure, which we argue is the correct one for this setting. And in the two offense setting, we devise a novel protocol that's native to the mode of operation for wallets. And we show that it's practical even for threshold ECDSA. In the T offense setting for any T greater than two, we show that it's unfortunately impossible to achieve this notion in any standard model. All right, so let's say Bob has some cryptocurrency that he would like to send over to Alice. The way he does this is that he takes out his laptop on which there lives some signing key. He pushes a button and produces a signature under this key to attest to this fact. If Bob's laptop gets hacked, an attacker could then steal his signing key and divert funds to herself. One way that we could get around this is to have Bob split his signing key into fragments, call them SK and SK prime, so that even if one of the fragments is stolen, the signing key in its entirety remains safe. Threshold signatures can achieve this notion where each of the signing key fragments live on different devices, and these devices must collaborate in order to produce a signature under the common public key. An important um, requirement is that the resulting signature looks indistinguishable from one that was produced by the original signing algorithm. For parameters, a three offense signature scheme should allow any three parties in the system to produce a signature uh, collaboratively. Whereas any two parties would be unable to collude in order to coerce a third into sending a message it doesn't want to. So let's return to our friend Bob from earlier. And the story doesn't end with the compromise of his secret key or with the compromise of one of the devices. Let's say that the attacker steals his signing key fragment on his laptop on a Monday. And on a Tuesday, Bob resets his devices so that the attacker is kicked out of the laptop. But unfortunately, on Wednesday, the attacker is able to break into his phone and steals the other signing key fragment. And now that the attacker has both halves of the signing key, she can forge arbitrary messages and just make Bob sad again. So one way to get around this is the following. Assume that the relation that the key fragments have is that SK plus SK prime will yield the common secret X. On Tuesday, in addition to resetting his devices, Bob also refreshes the shares of the signing key that these devices hold. That is, he replaces them with SKT and SKT prime so that they both add up to the same secret X. And on Wednesday, he does the same thing. So that now on Wednesday, when his phone gets hacked, the attacker now gets SKW, which is a share that only makes sense on Wednesday and can't be combined with SK prime. To see why this is the case, let's block out the things that the attacker doesn't know and we can now see that the attacker has two equations and three unknowns, and so the signing key stays hidden. This notion is called proactive security and was first conceived by Ostrovsky and Jung, and has seen a, variety, a number of follow-ups in a variety of scenarios, such as those very synchronous networks, the threshold signatures, in the dishonest majority setting, and even with dynamic committees. Okay. So where's the gap in the literature? What do we address? We observed that in all previous works, in order to make progress, that is in order to run the refresh phase, either an honest majority must speak or everyone in the system comes online. And this is not ideal for threshold wallets, for instance, because if we have the system configured to have T people sign, but twice as many to refresh, this could be inconvenient because there's a reason that the parameter achieved T was chosen to begin with. It also induces more risk because now that the attacker knows that all the devices in the system or 2T devices of the system are going to come online at the same time every day, um, it, it, could, it, could, it could introduce a new attack surface. So in this work, we study how to achieve proactivization where only a dishonest majority needs to speak. We show that the correct definition is quite subtle and we give a 2FN threshold signing protocol that achieves this notion uh, in a way that is native to the way that wallets operate. And we show that for T greater than two, this notion is unfortunately impossible to achieve. Coming to the definition, we know from experience with MPC definitions that 
when, is, when there's a dishonest majority involved, it's impossible to guarantee progress. And so a subtle aspect of, of finding the right notion is defining how the adversary can fail the protocol. So for, with some loss of generality, let's assume that we're looking at a system that employs Shamir sharing. That is, uh, we start by choosing a random degree one polynomial over ZQ, evaluating it at a bunch of points and giving each device in the system an evaluation of this polynomial at one point. And we define the evaluation of F at zero as the common secret, the signing key SK. This is a useful configuration because now we can sign with the two online devices let's say the phone and the laptop. And in case of some sort of error or a crash, we can bring the offline server back online and we can use its information to now recover the secret. So to see how this works in the context of proactivization, let's say on Monday, everyone has shares of polynomial S. We will need that on Tuesday, everyone has shares of a polynomial H, which is completely independent of F with the one constraint that they both evaluate to the same value at zero, that is the secret. So offline refresh protocols should work as follows. They, they, they employ some sort of interactive refresh phase on Monday between the offline device, sorry, between the online devices. And the online devices then send some sort of refresh package to the offline device and are on, go on their merry way. And when the offline device comes online, it's able to read the refresh package and apply the refresh so that is it has a share on the same polynomial H on Tuesday. And this is a success. Right, so the tricky part is defining how failures happen. So let's say that the among the two online parties, one of them is corrupt and decides to fail the protocol, the refresh procedure on Monday. And, and so on Tuesday, both online parties still have shares of F. But it could be possible for this attacker to send some sort of package to the offline device, the server in this case, that induces it to, when it wakes up, delete its share of F and move to some polynomial H to some value H3. So notice that this doesn't really harm um, unforgeability. That is, this, the secret that's encoded in F and H stay hidden. So the signature scheme that's built on top of this would still be unforgeable. But this creates another problem. That is, the same device could still be compromised on Tuesday, which means that F2 is basically inaccessible. And F1 and H3, when combined, don't really make sense. And so this means that the secret key is lost forever. And so what we want, and th this could be um, quite bad because in many scenarios, this could even mean a loss of funds that are tied to the public key for the account. So what we want is for parties to be in agreement. That is, honest parties should always be in agreement about whether to erase their shares and move to a new sharing or whether the uh, refresh procedure failed and so they must retain their old shares. We call this unanimous erasure. Now we construct a protocol that achieves this notion in the two offense setting. So the flavor of the problem is as follows. Point-to-point -point channels can convey information privately but can't be verified, while public channels achieve the exact opposite properties. So our approach is to use the point-to-point -point channels to convey private refresh information and a ledger to achieve consensus on whether or not to use them. Intuitively, we're going to link the public and private channels by the nonsense of the threshold signature and our new technique of interleaved threshold signing. So quick recap of ECDSA and Schnorr signatures. They're both based on the hardness of the discrete logarithm problem and the public keys comprise of group element X. A group element X, um, sorry, which is a point on the curve and a scalar, um, for the discrete log of which is lowercase X, which is a scalar of ZQ. And signatures sort of the form R comma sigma, where again, R is a curve point and sigma is some scalar. The important thing is that R is a random dance. So many threshold ECDSA and Schnorr protocols have this nice property in that they can be uh, the, the, they can be separated into two distinct phases. In phase one, this nonce R is produced, and in phase two, the signature is completed to produce sigma. And, and they have this interesting property where if an attacker were to abort the protocol immediately after phase one and not run phase two then the, the, 
induced signature, that is the sigma, the sigma that will verify for this nonce R remains inaccessible. That is the, the adversary has no advantage in um, computing the sigma that would be the full signature for this nonce R. And this is achieved by most natural threshold Schnorr and ECDSA schemes. So collapsing these two phases in, into blocks, our idea is to include some new in, is to generate the refresh information in the gap between phases one and two. That is, the refresh information is sigma, and we, sorry, the refresh information is delta, and we also compute some authentication information that binds this delta with this R that was created in phase one. So let's put this into its own phase. So the refresh procedure will be as follows. The parties run phase one to produce the nonce R, and then the refresh package uh, will include R delta and the signature binding them. And then the parties finish running phase two to produce the signature itself, and then post the transaction on the ledger. The important thing is that the online parties agree to complete the refresh procedure and uh, apply the update that they just generated only after the transaction um, and the corresponding signature appear on the ledger. That is the, imp the important thing to match is the nonce R. So when the offline party comes online, it is going to see, it is going to wait for the nonce R to appear on the ledger before, before applying this update. And when I say that this is native to the mode of operation, what I mean is that the transaction is unmodified and the signature was also unmodified and is going to go on the ledger anyway. So let's see what power an attacker has in this uh, protocol. The attacker could choose to abort the protocol after getting just the refresh package delta and before running phase two. What this means is that the ledger is never going to receive a valid signature under R that was created in phase one. And, and this means that this refresh package is now benign, it's useless because uh, the adversary has no information in completing the signature and so the signature is never going to appear on the ledger. The adversary could alternatively finish phases of one and the uh, uh, refresh package generation and complete phase two and keep the signature for itself, depriving the honest party of the signature. So there are two cases now. In the first case, the adversary could just decide never to post the uh, signature on the ledger. And this is fine because again, the refresh package is never going to be used by either the online honest party or the offline party. And the other case, the adversary could actually post the transaction and the signature on the ledger. And this is fine because this is almost identical to the honest use case, because both parties are going to delete their old shares and move on and apply the refresh package. And so now we have unanimous erasure. We implement this proactivization scheme to uh, proactivize an existing 2FN threshold ECDSA protocol. Thanks to Jack Donner for this. And also uh, threshold ECDS. Threshold ECDSA is more complicated than threshold Schnorr. It needs some additional machinery for multiplication. And so we also have to construct some uh, multiplier state refresh uh, protocols, which you'll find in the paper. Our experiments showed that there's very reasonable overhead for both computation and network costs. That's it. And for NET greater than two, unfortunately, it turns out that this notion is impossible to achieve. Uh, it, it, there are many details involved, um, and I would refer you to the paper for more uh, to find out more. Additionally, the paper, as I said, has um, more details on how to construct the machinery to refresh the rest of threshold ECDSA. If you're familiar with Beaver's trick for the randomizing OT correlations, that's how we do it. Um, and also we have more detailed benchmarks uh, for threshold ECDSA. And th there's a lot of nuance in finding the correct definition, uh, which we discuss in the paper. And of course we have proofs for a lot of these statements. Thank you, for, thank you for your attention. Please find our paper online, which also has links to our implementation. Thanks.